Okay, so today we're going to be talking about Blast. Blast is, um, Blast is an alignment tool that geneticists and bioinformaticians like to use. Um, so what an alignment tool is, real quick I'll demonstrate that. That just means that if we have something like this, like A, B, C, D, this is maybe a, a, like in some database somewhere. And then I have something that looks like this, like A, B, C. In real simple terms, an alignment tool is going to say that this part of, of this uh, series of letters is aligned. And that's a real basic example. The, um, the alignment tools that we use, like Blast, like the modern ones, are obviously much more complex than this. But that's the basic idea. That's really all it's doing is it's taking two pieces of text and it's telling you where are these pieces of text either identical or similar. So they don't have to be exactly the same. It could also be something like this. We could have um, something like hello. And then the other one could be like this, like hello with, with one O. And then we could say, you know, we could, we could talk about how related that these two words are as well. So that's what an alignment tool does in a in very simple sense. Now the kinds of alignment tools that geneticists use are um, they're specifically optimized for either protein or nucleic acids, so RNA, DNA, and strings of amino acids. They're specifically tuned um, for for those types of things. And what makes Blast really unique is that. It's, um, it balances performance and precision in some really clever ways that we'll talk about in a bit. Um, the, the, the kinds of tools that scientists had before BLAST were very good at giving totally um, good alignments. So if you had two, say you had two um, strings of DNA and you wanted to say where do these, what, what parts of these line up, they were very good at doing this, but they were very slow. So as long as you didn't have a whole lot of data, you were okay. And Blast does a much better job at being quick, and it's almost as precise. Uh, this is because Blast uses a heuristic. So Blast is not guaranteed to give you the best alignments every time you run it, but it usually will give you the best alignments or very, very close to it, and it'll do it in a fraction of the time that the older tools took to do the same thing. Um, and we use Blast to explore the evolutionary relations between organisms. So if I found uh, a new species and I sequenced its DNA, and then I wanted to see what other species is this organism related to, BLAST would be a very good way to do that. I could have a database of other known uh, mammals or reptiles, whatever type of animal I found, and then I could, um, I could query the DNA of the new species against that database. I could also uh, investigate the function of genes and proteins. So say I have a string of amino acids, and I want to know what the heck does this do, um, one good first step might be to compare it to a database of other proteins, and if it's similar to other proteins that do something like uh, a specific job, like maybe they are important for photosynthesis, or maybe they are uh, commonly used in, in digestion or something, then that might give me hints as to what my current protein does. So... An example of how BLAST works, again, we're using, we're using human words here, we're using just English, but this, is, this analogy would map very well to genetic data as well. So like uh, DNA and RNA, it would, it would map to that. It would, also, it would also be how it's used against proteins. So we ask, how related are the two following sentences? Well, we see that there's a lot of similarities, but they're not identical. Um, so one way of talking about the relatedness would be kind of all or nothing, right? We say, well, uh, the first sentence and the second sentence are not the same, so they must not be related. Or we could say, they, they, uh, we, could, we could look at each word, and we could kind of break it down into chunks, and we could talk about the chunks that are identical and the chunks that are not identical. This is very easy to do. The algorithms to do this are not very intensive, uh, not very computationally intensive, and they will... Uh, give you answers fast, but it's not the most useful information in the real world. And so the better answer would be to look for close matches. So in this case, um, maybe we could say something like, okay, for this, um, you know, for this sentence here, we have the matches in both of them, 
And then this one's a mismatch. But that's okay because the next part here matches as well. If some matches here, then there's a some more mismatches here. And we could do that kind of thing. And we could we could find the similarities and differences that way. This is much better for DNA uh, and protein stuff because in when we sequence DNA and protein, we we're gonna introduce small errors with our machinery, and also there's just natural variation. There's there's mutations. So you don't want to say, oh, these two animals aren't related because they didn't have the exact same liver enzyme, right? We don't want to say that. We want to say they're related if the enzyme is uh, close enough. And, you know, we could define whatever our threshold is for close enough. But we want to be able to get matches that are close without being identical. And BLAST does a really good job at helping us with that. And so this next slide, this next slide um, kind of goes over the steps of how we would how we would do this. Um, I summarized the Wikipedia page on this. There's a nice section there on the algorithm. You could go visit that, visit this link if you want, but um, and I'll, I'll put this in the description of the video. But basically, I just wanted to summarize this real quick to give a, a nice kind of high level sort of uh, view of what the steps are doing. So the first thing the algorithm does is it filters out low complexity regions. A low complexity region might be something like this, A, T, T, a, T, T, so adenine, thymine, thymine, adenine, thymine, thymine, if we're dealing with DNA. Um, it's just the same thing, maybe over and over again. Maybe this repeats for 100 times. And why do we want to filter this out? Well, we want to filter it out for two reasons. The main reason is that if we don't filter it out, we're going to get a ton of matches. So there might be a ton of different organisms that have the same sequence, um, and it's just not complex enough to be interesting. Like, it doesn't mean that those two organisms are related, it, it's just, it could be in lots of organisms. This could be like um, in, a, in a region that, that has a lot, of, a lot of repeats, like a telomere or something, or, a, uh, or any, any other region of, of DNA that is not very complex. And so it wouldn't be interesting to find the similarity. Also, it's less efficient for the algorithm. We don't want to search in places that we, we don't care about. Um, and we certainly wouldn't care very much, usually, about very simple matches like this. We just we just aren't interested in that. Um, and so step two is we break the query into words of size k. So let's say we had the following query, uh, the following query sequence of DNA. We had A, C, T, uh, G, and A, right? And let's say k equals three. So what we would do is we would just say, okay, this is a word this is a word and this is a word and so these would each each three of these sections so this a c t would be a word t uh, c t g would be a word and t g a would be a word and so we break it down into words like that and that's going to help us uh that's going to help blast be a lot more efficient and we'll see how it does it it uh, makes it more efficient in the next couple steps so once we've got these words, we only keep the high scoring words. So what I mean by that is um, words that share similarities with stuff in the database. So if we have a sequence and um, one of our words is A, C, T, G, A, A, whatever, you know, I'm just kind of making stuff up. Um, and this, nothing like this at all appears in our, in our database. We're going to throw it out. We're not going to, we're not going to like, search in places where there's unlikely to be a match, right? When you lose your keys, you don't start looking in your attic. If you know you haven't been in your attic in years, you're just, what are the odds of it being there? Um, so we're going to throw out those matches right away. We're just going to, or those mismatches right away. If it's obviously something that's not even close to something in our, uh, in our database. Okay, so then once we have a, when, once we find out that a word is, however, in the database, we add it to a search tree. So I don't want to get into too much detail about how like these kind of internal things work. And to be honest with you, I don't I don't always know um, how this stuff works internally in Blast. But this is kind of an implementation detail. We add it to a search tree or some kind of lookup table so that we could very efficiently access it later. Um, step five is to repeat steps in four for each remaining word. So if you're a programmer, you would be thinking like a for loop for each in words or something, you know, for each in words. Um, and then you would repeat these steps three and four over and over again for each word. Step six, we scan the database for exact matches. 
with high scoring segment pairs or HSPs. So we look for exact matches and that's a good place to start the more expensive algorithm from. Uh, again, so we're just, this is why it's a heuristic. We're looking for places where there's likely to be a match and we're going to prioritize those and we're going to discard some of the places where it's less likely for there to be a match. Um, we extend the matches to these high scoring pa segment pairs. Uh, we extend it to the left and we extend it to the right. So once we find a perfect match or a very near match, we start looking, we start expanding um, from the sides of that match. So say we found an eight letter word uh, in, a, in a protein sequence that matches the database perfectly. Now we start scanning sideways from it with a very expensive algorithm that is much more flexible and it will um, tolerate things like gaps. So if there were insertions or deletions in the DNA, it'll tolerate things like mismatches if there were point mutations and stuff. So we want to um, use this algorithm because ultimately this, this kind of algorithm gives us the information we want, but we don't want to use it everywhere. We want to be careful about where we use it. Otherwise, it'll take us, uh, you know, way, it'll, it'll take way too long. And this, this algorithm would be useless if, if it took that long. So we want to extend the matches. And then step eight, we list all the high scoring uh, high scoring segment pairs that score above a given threshold. So this could be a user input threshold. Like if it's, you know, when, when we're searching to the left and when we're searching to the right of that perfect match, we want to eventually stop when the score falls below a certain point. We want to say there's no point in going further here at this spot. And there's no point for us to keep looking for matches um, because it's just, we've, we've gotten the most out of it that we can. Uh, we want to evaluate the significance of the remaining high scoring pairs. So this is very important because uh, given, depending on the length of, of the pair and how many mismatches and gaps there are and stuff, um, they could, they could be, they, they could have, uh, very little significance or they could be very significant. So an example of, 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 a a hit, uh, that would be not very significant would be if you had a huge database and you had a word of length, maybe eight or something that matched. Yeah, that probably wouldn't be very significant, right? Because the odds of getting, um, a match of eight nucleotides of just any random sequence gets pretty high and you expect to see a lot of those just by chance. But if it was of length, say 500, now we're a little more interested in, in the fact that it came up. It's less likely for that to happen by chance. Um, we combine the nearby high scoring segment pairs into one. And this way we could get, uh, we could potentially get gapped alignments. So if there's like two high scoring segments that are near each other with no matches between them, it might actually make sense to look at that not as two separate pairs, but as a single single match that happens to have a gap in it. So maybe there was some insertions and deletions or things like that. Um, and this is actually a relatively new feature of BLAST. I mean, it, the original BLAST couldn't do gapped alignments, but showing gapped local alignments is, is uh, something that modern BLAST is quite good at. And the final step is to report all matches whose expected value is below a given threshold. So what I mean by expected value is, is the number of times that a query sequence of that length would appear in a database of a certain length. So the larger your database, the more likely that you are to just kind of get things that just happen to randomly match. Uh, so if your database like is huge and your sequences are relatively small, then it, it might not be so significant that they match. So this is basically going to keep us from reporting absolutely everything of any length that matches. Um, yeah, and so that's just the, that's kind of a high level overview of how BLAST works. Um, obviously, I left a lot of stuff out. I'll put this link in the description, though, so you could read the wiki page on your own and get more details.